Okay, so I'm Shriya Chatterjee. I'm Head of Research and Learning at the Paul Mellon Center. Uh, and firstly, I really want to welcome all of you to the day one of the Extractivism, Activism, Art, Activism, and Ecological Extractivism Conference. Thank you to all of you for who are joining us here today in London and also online. I wanted to give you as uh, my introduction a little behind the scenes view of why we wanted to have this conference in the first place and some of the thinking and uh, context behind it. As you may already know, um, today's conference is a collaboration between the Paul Mellon Center, which is down the road, by the way, um, and Autograph, uh, which is also in London, not far from here. And it's part of the multi-year climate and colonialism research project that I run at the center. The project as I see it is a testing ground really for transhistorical conversations and collaborations between art historians, artists, uh, and other scholarly and community groups thinking critically about the interconnected and enduring histories of colonialism, capitalism, and climate change. Since 1988, Autograph has championed photography that explores issues of race, identity, representation, human rights, and social justice, sharing how photographs reflect lived experiences and shape our understanding of ourselves and others. In our conversations with Mark Seeley and Bindi Vora at Autograph, what became clear was that the arts have long been concerned with highlighting the ongoing histories of extract extraction and its repercussions. The symposium asks, what next? Of course, we know that this is only the start of a much longer, complex conversation, but we're immensely lucky to have a group of scholars, artists, activists, and lawmakers from around the world joining us today, both as speakers and also in the audience, uh, to think together. Understanding extractivism means understanding that nearly anything can be extracted, mineral resources, labor, data, and cultures. One of the things we want to focus on and open up today is the relationship between colonial and extractive histories and our present moment the decisions we make, the things we want to fight for. How are long-standing systems of racial capitalism and colonial oppression linked to the current financialization of nature, which uses nature for profit maximization? What alternatives to these exploitative, exploitative structures can be imagined, tested, and shared in the arts? Some artists and scholars today, um, speaking today and tomorrow, will address the question of reparations for ecological collapse and environmental loss. What can reparative ec ecologies look like? How can they be mobilized? On the, topic of, on the topic of extractivism, it's important, even as we gather here today, to think about cognitive and epistemic extractivism, to think about how knowledge is produced, how it's circulated. The coloniality of knowledge production underpins the structures and practices of extractivism, which not only normalize extractive or extractivist operations, but also produce legitimacy for these. So what are we doing here in London today? And what should we not be doing as well? So the aim in the next two days is learn about very specific local projects as well as the kind of context of its global um, ramifications in, the, in so intersectional granular, granular detail to really collectively reevaluate the relationship between the arts, extraction and activism, both historically and in the present. The central question that got all of us here was this. What role can the arts play in enacting environmental justice? Can the arts inform and participate in policymaking on topics such as the rights of communities affected by ecocide and extractive capitalism, the rights of nature, and the rights of the future? So these are big questions, um, but I hope we can together make a start to think and learn from each other. And I think you have, we will know by now that it's taken a lot of work to get everyone here today uh, and tomorrow. Um, and we've had to change plans because of refused visas, which is perhaps not surprising, uh, and illnesses as well. However, the fabulous team at the Paul Mellon Center has managed to find solutions to almost every problem. And we have most of our speakers uh, who could not be here in person joining us via Zoom. So a big thank you to Doug and the Building Center um, IT team. And as all the speakers know, none of the complicated logistics would have been possible without the stellar work of Ella Fleming, Kathleen Ward, and Rebecca Tropp at the Paul Mellon Center. 
My thanks also to Mark and Bindi at Autograph, and thank you to all of you for being here. Both, both days of the conference are divided into sessions that are about one to two hours long, with short breaks in between for people to stretch their legs. And we have plenty of like tea and coffee breaks, so we want people to really talk to each other and get to know each other, because we're hoping to build also just community and uh, projects that can happen elsewhere from, from here. Um, as well. And I know for those of you who are joining online, it feels far away, but we, you know, there's, there's time for questions. Um, lunch is provided for those who are here. <laughs> Sorry <laughs> to the others. <laughs> and, um, and as you'll see in the program, the talks are quite short and they're meant to spark conversation. So get talking. And uh, we have time for questions, and we ask our online audiences, and this is important, um, to type their questions into the Q&A box, and my colleague Rebecca at the back will read, read out your questions. Uh, for those of us in the room, raise your hands, uh, and we'll do it the old-fashioned way. And speak into, our, into the mic so that people online can also hear you. Right, so before I go, I want to introduce Ravi Agarwal, who will chair our, uh, initiate our opening session. We have quite a few people joining us online for the first session. Uh, but Ravi is here, um, joining us from New Delhi. So thank you for being here. Um, so Ravi Agarwal is an has an interdisciplinary, interdisciplinary practice as an artist, writer, curator, and environmental campaigner. His research-based work mediates between art and activism to address the entangled questions of nature and its futures using photography, video, text, and installation. His work has been showed very widely, including the uh, Smithsonian's National Museum of Asian Art, various biennales, documenta uh, in Kassel, etc. Uh, Ravi is the founder and director of the environmental NGO Toxics Links, Link, based in New Delhi, and the Shama Foundation's Shared Ecologies Program, which supports emerging initiatives at the intersection of art and ecology in India. He has been invited as co-convener of the Bergen Assembly in 2025. Over to Ravi. Thanks. Uh, good morning, everybody. <clears throat> thank you for being here, and thank you, Shreya, Bindi, and Mark for inviting me and for hosting this fabulous event. Uh, my panel is mostly online. Uh, we have one, one person who's, uh, who's here, uh, Sylvia Kambi, but uh, everybody else will join on, uh, online. Uh, the first session is about locating environmental justice. And I'd just like to set a very short tone before I invite the panelists and introduce the panelists to you. Uh, from my perspective, environmental justice is a historical and pivotal term which now operates in an expanded field and intersectionally with social justice. To my mind, it is central to the ecological question today. However, it is more than, th more than that since it brings in not, on, not, not only all humans, uh, even from different and particular histories of oppressions, but also the more than humans who have been so far been left out. The question which can be posed is, what are the structures of power which have made violence against humans and nature invisible and normalized? To move beyond, as Shreya suggested, suggest a more radical shift, which is not only about inclusiveness, but also fundamentally shifting centers through a true de decolonizing of nature. The idea of such new natures rooted in environmental justice can be a way of thinking of futures to be explored through grounded and embodied practices. We need to listen to the forms of assertions and aesthetics of expression which emerge from these and the various modes of organizing they point towards, be they gatherings, collectives, collaborations, formal, fleeting, or amorphous. Today's session explores uh, four such practices from places around the world, and I think we are the, geographically the most diverse panel today. Uh, I'll introduce the four panelists uh, uh, straight away, and then we'll ask them to join. Uh, Sheila Rajbhandari is an artist and curator based in Kathmandu. Her work draws upon an embodied and speculative lineage of femininities to question the positioning of women across time, landscapes, and cosmologies. Her practice is a provocation to reflect beyond a neoliberal conception of time in order to decenter patriarchal structures that perpetuate cycles of industrial extraction and individual exhaustion. For her, art making is about creating space 
for collective action. Uh, Shilasha is one of the curators for the 17th Biennial Georgia 2023 and Columbus Scope 2024, uh, which incidentally was a fantastic event. Uh, uh, she co-curated the Kathmandu Triennial 2017, Nepal Pavilion at the Venice Biennial 2022, Garden of Ten Seasons at Savi Contemporary Berlin 2022, and 12 Bekash. Bhaktapur 2015 alongside Hitman Gurung. She's also a co-founder at Art Tree Nepal and an artist collective and Kala Kulo, an artist in an arts initiative. Our second speaker who will also join online is a colleague of uh, 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 Shilasha. Hitman Gurung is an artist and curator based in Lamjung near Kathmandu. Hitman's Diverse practice concerns itself with the fabric of human mobilities, frictions of history, and failures of revolutions. While rooted in the recent history of Nepal, his work unravels a complex wave of kinships and extractive uh, across geographies, an extraction across geographies that underscore the exploitive nature of capitalism. He further invokes indigenous methodologies and epistemologies to fundamentally reconfigure contemporary artistic prax praxis. He was one of the curators of the 17th Biennial uh, Georgia 2023, Columbus Scope 2024, and a co-curator for the Kathmandu Triennial 2017, uh, sorry, 2077 in 2022, and the Nepal Pavilion at the Venice Biennial 2022, the Garden of Ten Seasons at Savi Contemporary, Berlin 2022, and 12 Beshak Bhaktapur 2015 alongside Shilasha Raj Bhandari. He too is a co-founder at Art Tree Nepal, an artist collective, and Kala Kulo, an art initiative. Maybe it's better we hear these two people, then I'll introduce the other speakers just to keep them fresh in our minds. So uh, I think uh, we have to get Shilasha online, right? Um, I, uh, so we couldn't join, um, in person. We were supposed to join in person, but we could not, but, um, yeah, I'm, today I'm going to share about my own personal practice, uh, but also about artists with whom I've built a kinship with relationship with friendship with during the past, uh, decade and more, but also, uh, friends while well, we've worked in Gatman Triennale, uh, Dukza Biennale, um, Columbus Cope, uh, our friends and indigenous comrades in Atri Nepal and a colleague in in uh, uh, Kalakulu. Uh, dear Makasi, how can we cultivate sensorial resistance to a society that compels us to dissociate? Some days after our protest in front of the embassy of Israel in Nepal, I came across a post on Instagram that stated, anger is a luxury that we cannot afford. Excerpt taken from the poem, This is Why We Dance, by a Palestinian writer. Your resilience came to my mind when I read this. As an indigenous woman, you have faced and endured violence perpetrated by the state against you and your community during the armed resistance in Nepal. Indigenous, Dalit, and marginalized communities fought against the government casteism and the elites. In response, thousands lost their lives. This was in 1996 to 2006. Many were forcefully disappeared and injured and tortured. The district of Bardia in Western Nepal with the majority of indigenous Taru population bore one of the heaviest human losses during this period. Few months back, our friend Lavkan Saudari Tharu himself was invited to create a memorial in Bardia for the disappeared people. While walking near the forest, he came across a site where Sita Saudari, who was raped by multiple army officer, Royal Nepal Army back then, she has not been found till this date. Later at around 2, 2 a.m. in the morning, Lavkan Choudhury had a dream in which Sita Choudhury sat next to him face to face. When he woke up, the fan he had shot off was on. Similarly, 
other incident like that followed. When he shared this with some other villagers, this sort of experience with the spirit seemed to have been commonplace. But however, when he shared this with an activist friend, the friend laughed on his face. Dear Makasi, invalidating traumas is a format of asserting power. Is there, in fact, anything like actual solidarity? Or is, is it just for fleeting moments? Is solidarity just fleeting moments at the end of the day? Trauma can persist beyond the immediate time frame of the dramatic events, creating a ripple effect that transcends the individual who directly experience it, impacting, impact, impacting subsequent generations, relationships and communities. How do we acknowledge the pain our ancestors have gone through and also embrace the knowledge they have passed down to us? Alan Foning, who is from the Eastern Himalayas, shared how she went through a psychotic breakdown, also known as shaman's fever, only after, I mean, only after that she had the, only after when she had the breakdown, she actually realized that uh, she was uh, from the lineage of the woman shaman, also known as Moon. Her Lecha community from Mount Kanchanjanga holds deep spiritual significance as the locus of their origin story. The Tista River is fed by Kanchanjanga snowmelt and is also home to uh, the water dragon who carries and represents the memory stories and intimate relationship of Lepcha communities uh, and they have with the rivers. Um, at Jogja Biennale during the residency, she would have intense intuitive connections with the local spirits there, which would manifest uh, in the form of goosebumps. And her way of telling these stories is by making art. Acknowledging experiences like this is a form of resistance. There are such links that to the artist seemed more spiritual than happenstance. And in this way, contemporary art practice could relate to our realities and enrich our understanding of shared histories beyond the lens of nationalism, capitalism, archive or ethnography by centering lived experience uh, over theory. Isn't this time, isn't it time to decolonize the Anthropocene? For Lepcha and many indigenous communities, hydropower dams are not development projects. It is suffocating. Dams are killing their ancestors. So when the flood rushed down Tista River at Sikkim and parts of the dams were washed away, it was meant to be. It was the way to restore the balance. Dear Makasi, how do we address the insecurities, feelings, feelings of inferiority and anxieties that often accompany participating in such events while understanding the roots of imposter syndromes? Care should not be limited to the creation and presentation of art. It should also shape our approach to the dynamics inherent in art spaces. These challenges require collective effort to establish spaces within the art community that prioritize mutual support and understanding, addressing lingering insecurities and develop the practice of self-accountability as well. Dear Makasi, like yourself, I also am frustrated with our patriarchal, patriarch elders. In one hand, they are the knowledge holders while they also keep on perpetuating the problematic binaries, normative and neurotypical values. This complex situation is true in different spectrums, also in Shami community, like my friend said, or Maori, Maori community and Pacific, also a, 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 a conversation which came across a friend of mine. Yes, we are burnt out. We are tired of struggling actively, not only with the spec system, but also among the people we love and respect. Dear Makasi, you know better that most of the family functions are contested times. These events per perpetuate the expectation to conform to patriarchal rituals and to sacrifice the individual liberties for the sake of one's community. Wedding are such events which covers up deeper gendered conflicts with the uh, in the face of celebrations, glitters, and parties. Few days back, um, 
in this case, a few uh, months back, I attended such wedding. According to the ritual, we went to drop off the bride at the husband's release. After traveling for 10 hours on road, walking straight uphill for two hours uh, in 1,700 meters above the sea level, uh, because there was no road and also this uh, le- this sea level is actually average in the context of Nepal. Uh, after complaining about the gender jewelry and dress I had to wear while men were rocking their comfortable pants and after cursing my own big fat ass to be so anti-gravity and slowing me down, we reached the village. Uh, it's in these instances like this that uh, I also get reality check uh, and then I was also kind of like reflecting back to my own privilege. Um, In this entire journey, there was a glimmer of inspiration, though. Uh, We were greeted by dancing an elderly person, uh, a woman who uh, was in front of the groom's house, Chama, who was rocking her kazal mustache and recycled hat, the ancient form of drag, is particularly performed by elderly women during weddings. And this might have been continued from hundreds of years across multiple communities. I don't have the confidence, um, actually, Chama, like like to dance like you. Uh, I can't bear the multiple pairs of eyes gazing at me. Uh, but I really want to... Um, reflect uh, and and say to you that next time we meet Chama, I really do want to dance with you. Dear Makasi, dear Chama, dear Donkini. Dear Makasi, dear Chama, dear Donkini, dear Boksi, dear Ajima, dear Boksi, dear all the untabimbal spirits, I want to dance with you. I want to dance with you. My shout out to all the individuals and groups who've been creating safe spaces for people who come can't come out in the public and simultaneously also making, uh, reclaiming public spaces uh, and spreading awareness. Um, this was one of the conversation uh, with a colleague, Dear Makashi. Our shared connection must extend beyond uh, our trauma as a sole point of solidarity. A commitment to mutual care should uh, should not just be a survival necessity. Can we imagine a space where rest is not just a privilege and we celebrate the possibility of solace? Where we build solidarities that are authentic and aware of the power differences within our own communities. Dear Makasi, how can we cultivate uh, sensorial resistance to a society that compels us to dissociate? Thank you. Hello, everyone. Uh, it's a pleasure to be with you all, uh, even in, in like online virtually. So I'm, I'm going to go straight forward to my presentation. A scene takes place in the village where women gather in the center of a stone-paved courtyard, scattered around the sturdy walls. A handful of men are seated, while a figure dressed in a dark greenish-brown attire and wearing a hat or sits from a chair with a black boots and a wooden rod in hand. He executes an ear of authority. This figure is known as Rikute, a feared entity identified as a soul devil. Three armed men stand behind him. On his right, the revered village leader, known as the Mukhiya, is seated. A group of teenage boys sit trembling at a short distance, their head poured in fear. These occurrences persisted, haunts by the soul devil, at times expected and other times striking without warning, until the British Raj left the subcontinent, often hearing news of their impending arrival, villagers from young boys of 14 to middle-aged men 
will flee to the jungle, taking refuge from capture. Unfortunately, not all the women were fortunate enough to have their sons or husbands return home unharmed by the clones of soul devil. For the woman watching their loved ones depart was akin to biding them farewell for the last time. So this is a diary written by a Gorkha sergeant in the British Army during the Battle of La Vasse in Northern France, World War I, in 1914, uh, was retrieved by a German officer, Lieutenant Alexander Fiverr, on 20 December 1940. Uh, let me translate the left side of the letter. Uh, poor fellows, their youth was taken away by the army's hands. The love of the military was left behind in Nepal. We are the living dead who have gone to heaven only in World War, like their World War first, uh, more than 20,000 Gorkha soldiers were killed, uh, died. Uh, my father was one of the fortunate ones who managed to escape embarking on an adventurous journey back to our village from Lucknow, which is in India now. Uh, he endured a lifetime of trauma. After two failed marriages, he married my mother. I was born when he was 57 years old. He relocated with my mother and elder sister to a new small town, forsaking his ancestral land, a decision viewed as a shameful during that time. He passed away, burdened with guilt, representing someone who fled from the Great War. Yet thousands of so-called Braves Gorkhas died and disappeared in foreign lands without recognition, whom the colonial empire has. Uh, promoted as a, uh, projected and promoted as a symbols of uh, bravery and capitalized the tragedy. Within a short period of time, Nepal witnessed a series of political movements and struggle for representative democracy, a multi-party system, people's war, and the evolution of monarchy. Indigenous people, Dalits, marginalized group, women and gender advocates joined these movements, sacrificing their lives with the hope of achieving positive change and securing their rights and freedom. Um, unfortunately, these revolutions often were hijacked, developing into power struggles uh, dominated by the Brahmins. A person had joined the People's Liberation Army with dreams and hopes that the revolution will bring change to problematic social, cultural, and economical systems. This is sky, this house made of mud, stone, wood, orange and white clay, are all still the same, only the person is missing and his dreams have disappeared along with sweet, along with his sweat in the heat of the desert. My cousin brothers had built this primary school on the bottom of our village following the national dream. I still remember the children fighting, running around and screaming so loud that the hills and forests could hear them those rough and crooked benches, they looked the same. The walls had a new posters. There was one with a faded national flags, but now the entire school only has five or six kids. There is no noise, only silence. Uh, internal and external conflicts, such as the continual political instability, or 10 years long people's wars, as well as global capitalist forces have fundamentally altered the social fabric of developing countries like Nepal, carrying aspirations for a better future. Each day, thousands of Nepalis leave the country to join a cheap international labor force, mostly in the Middle East and Malaysia, Simultaneously, internal migration has translocated people from villages to small towns and small towns to cities. Villages are emptying and rapidly losing their social 
societal structures. Places like me, my village have been deserted and the farms left barren. The elderly caretakers watched silently as most able-bodied members of their family live one by one. In 2010, it's a, uh, one of the conversations uh, I'm going to share that I've come through during my research and meeting this person. Uh, in 2010, a friend and I went to Malaysia. During my stay there, I worked in a Chinese golf manufacturing factory for two years, despite a major monthly salary of just 450 ringgit. The work, working conditions were backbreaking. We toiled for 12, 14 hours per day without receiving any compensation for overtime. Dis distressingly, the owner would restore the physical violence if we failed to meet the demands. Sadly, my friends struggled to keep up with the fast-paced work, resulting in a frequent beatings from the owner. Over time, the relentless abuse took a toll on his mental well-being. He became extremely sensitive to noise. After breaking down into tears, even the slightest disturbance, Realizing his worsening condition, I took it upon myself to arrange for his repartition to Nepal. Despite his return home, the poor soul never fully recovered from the traumatic experiences he had endured. My community has been serving as Gorkhas for several generations. However, the pattern of migration has now changed People from every geography and ethnic groups are migrating as temporary laborers, most of whom hold menial low paying jobs. Nepal's economy is heavily dependent uh, on the remittance sent by these work, very workers. Globally, Nepal ranks high in terms of foreign remittance as a percentage of the country's GDP. Yet the government has not paid serious attention to the rights of migrant workers. Neither has it developed better policies regarding their safety. The laborers, most of whom <clears throat> are young and middle-aged, come from marginalized and underprivileged backgrounds. They live their families and their homeland with the dreams of pursuing a better life. Sadly, migrant laborers are often subjected to exploitation abuse, slavery, uh, uh, like conditions, and untimely deaths are common among migrant workers. These forests have stopped breathing. Uh, rivers have forgotten their dance. Mountains are coughing and are now black. Our lands discarded and deserted, but can we Dismiss our spirits. Thank you. I'm sorry for the technical error. So we have in person here Swabia. Serbia. Hi. <laughs> I tried to get the pronunciation right. <laughs> Gambi, a distinguished facilitator at the Transart Institute and visiting professor at the Academy of Fine Arts, Nuremberg, is a co-founder of, of Untethered, Untethered Magic, an initiative supporting contemporary arts in Nairobi. Her work merges artists with creatives uh, across disciplines, fostering knowledge building and process-based practices. Kambi's artistry employs photography, video, drawing, and sculpture to explore cultural identities and contemporary human experiences. Her installations narrate stories and activate objects addressing issues of loss, memory, race, and gender. Kambi's approach takes aim at the politics of the time and its legacy today, questioning what is remembered, what is archived, and how we see the world anew. And our final panelist, who will also join online, is uh, Sahar Kwasimi. She's a Palestinian architect and artist. 
She studied architecture at Birzeit University. She joined the team at Rivak Center, where she worked on restoration projects and research. In 2005, she received her MA in architecture from Miami University, Oxford, USA, where she was awarded the American Institute of Architects Award in 2007. Uh, Kwasimi curated art exhibitions and in 2019 founded Sakya Residency and Research Center in Ain, uh, Kenya, Ramallah, along with Nidhi uh, Sinokrot. Sakya is as a nomadic, uh, uh, Sakya uh, is uh, like a nomadic organization. In 2017, they were entrusted with a natural and historic site in Ain, Kenya, west of Ramallah, owned by the Zaltimo family from Jerusalem. Sakya's core program includes food production, exhibitions, symposia, publications, and education training workshops, exploring the intersections between art, science, and agriculture in a sustainable and replicable model. So, uh, welcome. Hi, everybody. <laughs> uh, thanks. Um, very nice to be here. Uh, yeah, sure. It's been a, it's a bit a long, slow morning, no? Or is it just me? Um, yeah, I'm not really going to share much about my art practice today. I really want to speak about untethered magic. Uh, this map is uh, was made like by me for me. <laughs> it's something I started in 2013, kind of stopped and put on a shelf in 2015. It was up in my studio for a, a year and a bit, where also other people would add their knowledge to it. It's not a legible map for like public consumption. It was really an attempt for me to kind of figure out um, my placement in the art ecosystem that I am functioning in Nairobi, Kenya. And uh, I think I'd like to pick this map up again and make it into one that is legible. But also the last kind of step in, in the process is to figure out the money trail uh, in this map as well. So uh, it really was a way to figure out how to navigate the system I'm in, to understand uh, where I'm in and where I want to go. Um, yeah, and so to give you a little bit of context, um, we have quite a, a difficult context that we're working within. Um, currently, our Ministry of Culture has been pulled into two parts. We've got uh, culture sitting under heritage, which sits under wildlife and tourism. And we've got art sitting in with youth and sports as two different departments now. This happened last year. Um, previous to that, it was gender, sports, youth and art. Uh, and previous to that, to give you more context, in 2008, we had about 9,000 euros in Kenya for the budget for um, sports, youth and art for the whole country. Just to give you a framework of what kind of resources. So we don't have the, what's the one here, national youth, uh, national art? Yeah, yeah, that's no, not, not, not a resource to apply for funding for or anything like that. Um, there are advantages as well. I just wanted to give you kind of a bigger context of what, what I'm, uh, where I'm playing inside of, let's put it that way. Um, and then a couple of years ago, this uh, image uh, crop crept up in an, in an article that Tim Ingold wrote. Uh, and uh, I'm not so much interested in the article, but really the, the image of the figure uh, with the ground. And that's really been a grounding image for Untethered Magic to kind of this practice of trying to be with continuously. It's not something that is uh, like you don't learn. It's not, I don't think you ever fully get it. It's something you have to constantly practice. But thinking with and being with and practicing that and how it takes different forms and shapes is um, an ongoing kind of thing we keep grappling with and playing with. And I'll get into that a bit more. Um, I keep thinking, oh. I keep thinking, oh, it's, it's actually multi multiple as well. It's not a singular activity. Um, and then there's this dream that it's like nice and uniform and together. But no, this is kind of chaotic and isn't so clean cut and is quite complicated. Um, and this uh, in labor of communicating where you're at, understanding that internally, taking the time to um, 
unpack that, explain that, and being received, understood, explained, unpacked, and then things have shifted, and you have to keep doing it. Right? It's not a. It's not a. It's not a formula you can work in. It's like, oh yeah, we can apply this all the time. So, under the magic is um, luckily property is built on property that I, I own. So there's. Um, I'm going to speak quite a little bit about structures and, and running systems. We're located behind the National Park in Nairobi, so we're not in the city center. Um, that's also important as a place of respite. This is just a Google map thing. So I'm with here. <laughs> um, there's a constant navigation with nature as well. The park, the boundary of the park is just a river. Um, so there's a lot of navigation with wildlife um, that we have to kind of bear in mind and there's kind of the area is constantly changing as well. There's a lot of um, development happening. There's a lot of people from the city who have kind of moved and built city-like houses there. Um, this is the first structure uh, that I built on the ground. It's also my bedroom. Um, I don't know if I'll change it. I've had very many arguments about this door because <laughs> I love it, but I did recently change it. Um, but the, it's like a, I really moved in a, yeah, it was a, a sanctuary type move. And I think the previous first speaker talking about like spiritual transformations, I've had like two kind of very key moments um, that have led me to a breaking down and a rebuilding kind of state, which was essential. And I think... I've always wanted to create a space for um, residencies, but I think in my 20s and 30s, I would have kind of transported a lot of what I had learned from the West into this space, which wouldn't have been as fruitful as I feel as it is now. Um, the kind of... Your, your, the housing is always built as in need and as what is possible in certain time. Um, so you're never in, it's also a traditional kind of architectural structure without using traditional materials. Um, but you're constantly on the ground and with the earth in a sense. Um, it's also the end or start of the Rift Valley. There's also obsidian stones, so there's paleo, evidence of Paleolithic life there. Um, and it's got an energy that's kind of very, uh, how do you say, not turbulent, but it's active all the time, which uh, I've noticed, and, and my colleagues, Kieran Nash and Kiba Wangunyu, who run the space together with me and co-founded the space together with me, we're also like, uh, ah, this active thing is very great if you're coming in and having some time there and leaving, but to live in it is also a question, which we're also now uh, navigating and grappling with. Um, we used to all co-live there. Now it's just two of us who co-live there with my son. And now I've actually moved to Nuremberg temporarily for two years. Complicated. But it's kind of like a... Uh, it's also fluid, which why the name Untethered Magic has that um, fluency to it. This is uh, the st studio shot. I wanted to share with you a little bit about my studio because it is a mobile structure. And this thing about fluidity and mobility has always been kind of present in the back for me um, of having some flexibility, which I think... Yeah, we can get into it later. There's definite reasons with um, for that. Um, so now, uh, I, I, I actually I was sitting and I was thinking time is one of the things that's not present in this map. And if I was to put it, I would have it like in the green spiral guy. Um, so time is a super important uh, element, and Untethered Magic is really not interested in in production. It's interested in in giving time and space and having autonomy and self sustainability. Um, the, the the also the little arrows in the center. Does this work? Oh no, it doesn't show you anything. Okay, so this guy here. Um, I think of that as a kitchen. Um, I have to figure out how to show that that's a kitchen. <laughs> that's how our kitchen is functioning, really. It's a base. It's also a very open uh, space. It's got three exits and entrances, and it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's where we always congregate and do a lot of stuff. Jijenga is a, a residency we've designed for artists who are uh, in Kenya but not from Nairobi. They're from other counties in the country. Um, we run it by running a bar. So the bar um, generates the income for Jijenga. Jijenga uh, has yet to run. Basically, we'd like to have uh, the month of November for six people from different counties to come. There's a thing about Nairobi being the hub of the art industry, and if you're not in that city, it's very hard 
to plug in and function. Um, my assumption is we'll probably end up attracting, uh, like there's a, the thing about like, people living in other counties being artists, but the understanding of like a conceptual contemporary artist, it would be, I'm assuming we're having a lot of crafts people coming and there'll be some negotiation of like how to identify somebody who really wants to plug into an art scene in terms of um, contemporary thinking and conceptual thinking. And that's a, a journey that will take some time. Uh, but that one is really about networking and not so much being based in untethered magic as its ground. Um, there's obviously open space, which is anything, really. <laughs> Self-initiated residencies happen in April now. We've kind of tried to tailor our, our system a little bit from how it first started, and it's a self-initiated thing. You can apply, and if you're interested and you have access to resources that help you um, to come and stay and have time out, that's there. Uh, but we also run in a tier system. So um, we have a kind of like a, how do you say, a kitty or a leftover fund that basically for uh, artists who can't like afford and access resources to funding models uh, this is only for Kenyan artists that they can actually get two weeks or three weeks or however much the kitty is able to offer so it's like a we are we always kind of moving and playing a bit Ujuzi mentorship program is just the first one that started this year it took us about two and a half years to design and get off the ground this is done in partnership with Nkai the Nairobi Contemporary Art Institute the Nairobi Contemporary Art Institute is the first uh, non-commercial gallery to be in the East African region um, they're a baby still they're like two hi oh yay <laughs> they're like two um, two years old now and uh Still like growing in terms of its public programming, which is the most essential part, I think. Um, but it, like in my lifetime, this is totally new, never existed when I was practicing, hence the making of the map to figure out what the hell to do with my practice. Um, Ujuzi's running three people. We've actually got a mentor in the, in the thing, Elena, yay. She's one of our mentors. Um, uh, there's three artists uh, from Kenya, and then there's Usha Sijirim from South Africa as a mentor, Abdullah Qureshi um, from Pakistan as a mentor, and Elena Machkeveska from, uh, not here, but here. <laughs> um, and long-term partnerships are kind of a huge thing for us. We have a long-term relationship with Performing Borders, also with Nkai, uh, also with uh, different individual people, um, somebody also named Peter, who runs a clay space near Kibera, and like this networking and building bridges is also a thing about like very long relationships that I think of is something I've carried from the way I like to work, which is also embedded into Untethered Magic. Um, we're really interested in solar power. It's quite expensive to start up and, and, and run, actually. Um, we've got one small uh, step in, but we need to like build an entire system so that we could get more autonomous. We've got a biodigester, which means your poop is getting cleaned and we can water the plants. Um, <laughs> you cannot eat the plants, so we're only uh, watering the bushes. Um, we did want to do one for our kitchen, but it, we're kind of like, uh, we're not experts and people keep coming and saying, no, 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 this one you can't put on the plants. You know that you want to eat. So for, the, for now, it's just the natural plants. If anybody has any advice or ideas about this or expert, please come to me because <laughs> I am not. Um, what else can I tell you? Uh, water collection is huge for us because we're on rocks. It's like a shambaya maue is what people say, like a farm of stones. So farming is super hard. You're going to have to bring in like soil and stuff. We're on a gorge and a rocks. So that's like, these are the two kind of areas that are the next up for us. Um, we have tiny cabins, which are fantastic. Uh, yeah. Oh, time. Scheiße. Okay. Small cabins. Um, <laughs> Yeah, that's our model for like bringing in another ecosystem of finances. Uh, holding discomfort, super important for us. Uh, on off season, rotating roles, meaning uh, as a trio, we have different roles. Some images and then I'll shut up. <laughs> that's the land before the A-frames. That's the kitchen. We've used the kitchen for like workshops and performances, but now we also have another space for that. That's a cabin. Another cabin, inside of a cabin, where you can sleep. <laughs> That's a view from a cabin. It's a library. It's an ongoing work. Map making is a big deal. I'm not going to get into it because of no time. These are two systems, Pilar Onions and Internal Available Resources. Anybody interested in those methods for like um, unpacking stuff, come to me later. 
and then banana. I love this picture. And I'll just say that one quickly before I finish. Um, so I took this photo. This banana was in a supermarket uh, in Rongai. Rongai is the closest town to where we are. And uh, it's uh, bananas from Uganda are very popular in Kenya. Like Ugandan food is yay. Kenyan food is okay. And um, I loved it because in order to cross the border, somebody stitched the banana fiber uh, to seal the split. It had split open. Um, so I really like this uh, because it gives me a lot of inspiration for potentialities of thinking differently. Um, and also, yeah, this wouldn't happen in Europe. <laughs> like such a great solution. And yeah, that's, that's it. Sorry for taking time. So uh, my name is Sahar Qawasmi. I established uh, Saqia Art, Science and Agriculture with Nida Sunukrot, my partner. Um, it was uh, a nomadic um, space uh, working in derelict sites and community centers in Palestine uh, since 2012. But in 2017, uh, we were... Uh, established in this uh, area, in this piece of land you see you see in the foreground uh, in Ain Kenya, a village very close to Ramallah, only seven kilometers. I will start by giving a brief introduction about the political and demographic changes and challenges in Palestine that led to the establishment of Sakya. Uh, colonization and its policies of extraction and land annexation in Palestine have resulted in a shift in labor trends. Since the 1967 occupation of the West Bank and Gaza, uh, Palestinian labor shifted from working in agriculture to, uh, to building and manual labor and service industries in Israeli projects, factories, and settlements. There are 150,000 documented workers from the West Bank and Gaza in Israel, conditioned to precarity. Uh, the erection of uh, Israel's apartheid wall, separating uh, villages from their arable lands in, 2012, uh, in 2002, marked uh, an increase in exodus to West Bank cities infused with foreign aid, cultural funding, and Palestinian authority jobs. This also marks a shift in narratives of resistance from one where struggle to work and protect ancestral lands is replaced by a struggle to secure mortgages, leaving most farming villages shadows of what they once were. The occupation uh, continued annexation of our land and water resources, the apartheid system of enforced geographic fragmentation and segregation, the post-Oslo rise of neoliberal policies in the West Bank, and the enjoyization of our civil society uh, has created um, an increasing number of disenfranchised youth and an inability of our education system to cope with this situation. Um, these are all reasons that compounded conditions that led to the establishment of Sakia. Uh, Nida and I um, had so many questions uh, before we established Sakia, and a lot of the uh, ideas and words and uh, methodologies I will be sharing are uh, Nida's uh, ideas and words, uh, and some were also collectively uh, created. And usually uh, I give this presentation with Nida. So uh, today I will be speaking uh, on behalf of the two of us. Uh, so we were asking how can the merging of artistic methodologies with agricultural practices address this loss of cultural capital, the memory of an indigenous mythology once deeply rooted in an embodied balanced stewardship of nature. Pre-colonized mythologies, we argue, can be surfaced with artistic methodologies that embrace alternative agricultural traditions and repair the loss of uh, cultural capital. 
uh, we opted from the premise that cultural funding was exacerbating a culture of dependency. Um, we sought to bring the sites of cultural production and food production back together. But if the ancestral farm is annexed and the museum is inaccessible, what could we do? Uh, I want to just speak a little bit about the first project we worked on uh, in collaboration with the Khalil Sakakini Cultural Center in Ramallah. And with this project, we started with our um, uh, symposia, uh, our first symposium um, of the Under the Tree was titled Taxonomy, Empire and Reclaiming the Commons which was uh, done in collaboration with Dr. Shila Sheikh. Uh, in this uh, first project, we established a community garden, a compost center, uh, did um, um, agriculture courses, a movable garden, and a movable library with Marcel Mars, um, Anika Barkan, Saad Dagher. Uh, this is our site. So in 2017, Sakia Art Science Agriculture was formally established as a progressive academy, residency program, research hub, and a farm located in Ankenia, a small village uh, just seven kilometers west of Ramallah. The rewilded hillside on which Sakia sits is home to two holy trees. Uh, this is the holy oak. And this is the holy uh, a Greek strawberry tree that sits right next to uh, a holy shrine of uh, the Sheikh of Abu Al-Ainain. Our oak tree is sits on the spring of Umm al which means mother of eyes or mother of springs. Here's the spring. Our Land uh, is owned by the Zalatimu family, but it had fallen into disrepair since the 1967 occupation. We are in Area C, which means we are under full Israeli military control, colonial policies of control over the land and its resources, and a fragmentation of social and economic structures, and dismantling of communal ways of working and organizing and caring and maintaining of the land are some of what we face on a daily basis. Uh, I would like to share with you our vision. Uh, Sakya's vision is liberation through a society whose confidence is rooted in traditional and contemporary ecological practices, whose tolerance echoes nature's diversity, whose generosity springs from collective labor, whose creativity is enriched by the intersections between art, science, and agriculture, and whose prosperity is shared beyond boundaries. So as we work, we keep um, this vision for liberation um, at the forefront um, through all of our activities and programs. Our research explores ways in which collective action and art practice can decolonize the visible and hidden infrastructures of occupation that govern our relationship to nature more generally. By connecting knowledge intimately to the land, Sakya addresses the challenges we face locally while developing methodologies at the intersection of art, science, and agriculture as part of a worldwide commons that we share through teaching, publishing, and exhibiting. This polycultural approach, which we call rewilding pedagogy, employs symposia, exhibitions, a summer school, garden classrooms, a community kitchen, uh, celebrations, and a thematically driven open calls, as well as discrete artistic interventions. To rewild our imaginations, we have to rewild our narrative structures as well as our environment. In our garden is our classroom initiative. Our rewilded site becomes a canvas for different ecologies, each with a set of aesthetic, architectural, sensorial, social, political, historical, and environmental qualities. These gardens as classrooms function as common spaces for various artistic and academic philosophical discourses and are inspired by the historical forests 
olive and citrus groves and vineyards all, all around us. The different gardens host learning, reading, and discussion groups, art interventions, communal activities of making, sharing, planting, cooking, and eating together. Community members of Ain Kenya, our host village, are actively involved in the stewardship and design of our site. Our outdoor classrooms utilize traditional learning concepts, including mujawara, which means to be one's neighbor or to be taken into protection. In this old Islamic tradition, an apprentice becomes a very close neighbor of a master, uh, observing, asking questions, taking notes, assisting, discussing, and sharing. This mujawara takes first and foremost nature as the master and also everyone else in the classroom. The classrooms take on different formats, inspired by the halaqa, which is a link in a circle, a circle of mu'allimin or knowledgeable ones who share, ask, listen, and imagine together. Uh, here, you can see some pictures of uh, the rehabilitation uh, projects that we took on on site to fix our historic buildings. Uh, some with the histories that uh, date back to 1,000 years ago. And uh, these buildings were renovated through uh, internship and apprenticeship programs that brought uh, young men and women to our site, learning traditional uh, tools and methods in restoration and renovation of our lands and historic sites. Um, we engage with the rehabilitation of the land and natural resources through uh, traditional buildings, such as the, the rebuilding of the stone walls, uh, you can see here. And this craft uh, has almost uh, died in the West Bank and through uh, working with the uh, uh, older builders from the village and around us, we were able to uh, rebuild most of these walls and also teach our younger uh, generations uh, to create uh, more possibilities for uh, diverse uh, work and engagement with the land. I think I will stop here and uh, maybe we can come to speak about other projects uh, through the discussion. Thank you very much. I'm, I'm struck by the construction of the panel itself because it no, not only relocates the way we think about land, spirit, violence, but also relocates how we think of art itself, what is art in a sense. So it's very productive. But we're all dying for some questions from, <laughs> from the floor. Yeah, I'm Kat. Um, and I just want to talk about the Untethered Magic project. So, um, yeah, I just love that name. And I just wanted to know, like, from your perspective, what's the relationship between, like, magic and art? And how do you ground that in your practice? Um, yeah, yeah. Uh, okay. <laughs> it's uh, in my practice... This is a little bit different from Untethered Magic, so there's an overlap, but um, yeah, no, I have a, a bad history with uh, magic. I come from a lineage of um, a very powerful um, world, and uh, it's, uh, I used to create works without this knowledge, um, which was quite dangerous for me. And I had to I had make a real shift for myself and um, find another mode of um, working where my intuition wasn't being hijacked. Uh, but that was a longer, uh, different kind of process. And then in terms of um, magic, I think play, play, play and, uh, is important and being a bit silly is an essential ingredient <laughs> in survival. Um, and I think the, the name Untethered Magic actually came from um, Kiba's brother's Wi-Fi uh, router. <laughs> so, 
Yeah. <laughs> but I think this uh, playfulness and fluidity need to be activated all the time for like niceness to happen. Yeah. Yes, please. Come in there. Oh, hey, thank you. Um, yeah, thank you for the talks. It's been really interesting so far. Um, I actually came in a bit late, so I, my question is for the last two, so for Saha and Sylvia. Because um, I'm quite interested in exploring this idea of creating a um, like an artist space or residency space which sits outside of, or as outside of as possible, like colonial capitalist structures. But I've been born and brought up here, like I'm mixed Dominican heritage, but born and brought up in the UK. Um, so I'm wondering how you kind of navigate that. I'm not sure what your paths were or if you have any kind of... Um, if you've like sought inspiration or advice elsewhere, or if you have any points of like things to maybe look at or things to like disregard from day one. Sir, would you like to take it? Sure, thank you for the question. Um, I think a lot of the work that we're doing, and there's there are so many projects that uh, grew over the past uh, few years. And today we find ourselves um, feeling more settled in how things are. And I think that comes from a deep connection to the land. So I think whatever a project like this would be established to, to, be, um, to be connected to the community, uh, to be connected to the stories and histories uh, of the land uh, organically becomes an act of uh, decolonial practice. And so we find ourselves engaged and um, uh, coming together in learning and education and, and making and, and uh, uh, very diver diverse acts of communing, which we talked about in the past. We wanted to create a place where we uh, come back to the idea of the commons, uh, re-establishing the commons on our lands and uh, working with the commons to uh, take care of the land and maintain it and reclaim our rights to it. But we find that these, um, uh, these practices come naturally as we work. And so over the years, I think uh, we find ourselves doing things that we learned from our ancestors. And at the same time, we found ourselves developing new uh, communal ways of, of doing things that could be, uh, could be very specific to this land, could be very specific to the, to the people who are working at that moment. Uh, to the different ages and genders and uh, backgrounds of the people who are engaging in, in a certain project. And so um, I feel like uh, I think this is a very, very general and wide advice of uh, uh, creating this deep connection. But uh, um, I feel like uh, that's where it all starts. Thank you. We have time for one more question, I think. Yes. Hi, uh, my name is Sarah. I just want to thank everyone for all the contributions. Um, this question is not addressed to anyone in particular, so whoever would, if it resonates. I was just really curious in terms of everyone's practice that they've shared, what uh, has arisen in terms of reconfiguring the relationship, a multi-species kind of relationship, human to animal, and, and where that sits in this kind of rewilding a kind of practice. Would you like to take it from Nepal, somebody? Sheila Shah, Hedman? Uh, I think I can give some, like, my, <clears throat> my feedback on it. Uh, like, in lots of indigenous community, uh, you know, like, human being is also kind of one of these species uh, who is part of this whole larger ecosystem. Uh, so, but because of uh, recent uh, lots of modern intervention and development projects, uh, it has directly affected and distorted the ecosystems uh, in many areas. So, yeah, I think uh, you want to add on something? 
So yeah, well, but it's, it's like a whole, you know, like it's somehow connected in a very holistic manner. Uh, like in my community, especially, we have this transhuman traditions, very strong transhuman traditions, uh, which has been, you know, like passed on to generations, like since centuries, but now in the recent times, uh, lots of reasons now these practices are in danger, kind of now. Not, you know, like lots of the young generation doesn't want to take it uh, and continue. Uh, and also because of the migrations, this practice has been, you know, like somehow uh, almost uh, died in many villages in Nepal. Uh, it's also like, I think, important to uh, acknowledge how a lot of the knowledge is, uh, are, are continued through not through women's bodies. Um, from generation to generations, and women's body itself becomes becomes the contested territories. There are also a lot of uh, there. There is indigeneity, uh, but also a lot of religion, religious syncretisms, and the new rise of uh, ultra fundamentalists. Uh, and then there's a lot of mixtures and uh, uh, confusion also along the way. And sometimes, you know, just having this very purist and romanticized idea or binary oppositions also can be very counterproductive in a way. Mm, and in this day and reality, uh, like then also a lot of indigenous people now having to move to urban spaces and then outside of Nepal um, for labor and education and migration and what does indigenous indigeneity means itself for a person who is not living in Nepal itself and 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 of course uh, they're in London, uh, UK. Uh, there there are huge uh, um, um, diaspora indigenous Nepalese. Um, so these all these complexities kind of also comes along. Um, yeah. One last question. Oh. <coughs> Thanks. Um, it's just really the across all the projects, really the kind of precarious nature of survival. And it feels as though the, I'll just say it again, the precarious nature of survival in terms of these projects. They feel very much on the edge all the time. And I was thinking about the impact of the kind of emotional stress and the burden that one has in relation to keeping, you know, the project literally alive in that sense. So I think there is, you know, after working through these kind of colonial spaces, I think the kind of emotional taxing as well, Just I just wanted to bring that to the fore in terms of the impact it has on the various geographical sites that you have, which are incredibly different, massively diverse, but come with a kind of shared sense of um, wanting to push back against a kind of global neoliberal force which if you do then become successful, becomes a pressure for you to almost become the thing that you're working against. Okay. Uh, sure, I mean, yeah, I, uh, that's why autonomy is quite important and getting off the tit. <laughs> it's a money. <laughs> so with that comes quite some power, right? If you can if you can find a system that helps you get off the funding models that we are all kind of dependent on, right? That even now we can see how precarious they are, um, especially right now. Uh, yeah, and I think uh, communal that. Commune and communal came up a couple of times. It's not too, you're not working alone. Um, yeah, I don't know. And, you know, somebody told me a long time ago, it's not your job to fix it. Um, so some of, for me personally, what came up with Untethered Magic is, is a certain resource that I needed as a younger practitioner working in Kenya that wasn't there. Um, and it shouldn't just be me tra traveling like a flea everywhere. And then, like it, I can bring some interesting people home instead. That'll have a totally different kind of 
um, health as well. Yeah. So, uh, sorry, some, Sarah, somebody say, Sarah, please. Sarah? Yeah, sure. Uh, thank you. I, I didn't hear uh, the whole question at the beginning. The sound wasn't very clear, but um, I understood um, the question regarding the um, emotional stress that uh, could be associated with working such projects, uh, especially precarious uh, and um, under colonial contexts. Um, it is it, it is a very good question, and um, it makes me it makes me think, and I think that uh, um, it is it, what we're doing is the kind of the answer to this emotional stress. I feel like if I was working uh, anywhere else at this time, especially when my people are uh, being genocided, it would have been a very different, um, a very different feeling. But what we're doing is to reclaim uh, this piece of land through being together to to pick herbs, which becomes picking herbs from the land, foraging becomes um, uh, an act of resistance because we're not allowed under Israeli uh, policies to forage. So every little act that is associated with protecting the land and being on the land becomes a very uh, powerful um, act of resistance. And so uh, these questions about uh, emotional stress, but also about uh, what could artists do, what could uh, cultural practitioners do, uh, become a little bit um, irrelevant because what they should do is uh, is exactly resisting, um, and that's what we what we're doing. That's how it feels. And so I think that emotionally, despite um, a lot of times the feelings of uh, helplessness and feelings of um, sometimes even hopelessness. Um, this, these acts of becoming and uh, working together and coming together is what uh, helps us survive. I think it's, uh, it's always about survival in Palestine. It's about every moment and every moment has a new uh, thing that comes that could end your life and or way of life. Um, so it is... Uh, a continuous act of survival, but at the same time, there is a continuous um, vision of liberation that that doesn't seem very far all the time, although it's been so many years. And so it is this interesting also understanding of time and, and imagination of um, uh, a future that is very near, but it requires, requires every moment of uh, an act of resistance and steadfastness. Um, I, I'm still also like trying to come up with words to be able to express how I'm feeling and thinking about this, but thank you very much for the question. And I'm actually honored to be in the company of four practitioners who, uh, through the intersectionality of art, ecology, and justice, redefine each of, each of these spheres, I think, which is really the call of the times. So thank you very much uh, for, for hosting this and for all, all my participants. Um, I <laughs> The mic, thanks. Uh, big thank you. Um, uh, Shilasha, Sahar, uh, Hitman as well. We know you can't be here for, well, visa reasons, uh, but we really were so grateful that you could join us uh, on Zoom. And uh, yeah, it's a reminder that.
uh, colonialism isn't a thing of the past and we're kind of continuing in colonial time. So thank you.